Hey, um, tonight I'd like to talk to you about uh, setting the watch. Um, as many of you know, uh, we uh, Bible study students who um, have been reading and studying in God's Word, we are commanded as watchmen to set the watch so that we can warn the people so that the, the blood is not on the hands of the watchman. So uh, I put in the description some scripture verses that I want to look at for um, what they call the middle watch. Now the middle watch was defined as Exodus, uh, it was defined as midnight to 3 a.m. So you get the basically the middle of the night to 3 a.m. is the darkest hour, the middle of the night. That is the middle watch. And if we begin this study in Exodus 12, 29, we see the significance of the middle watch. So if you have your Bibles, go to Exodus 12, 29. And basically we're going to the story of the Exodus. Um, I'll type it in here. This was the last plague before the children of Israel finally got to leave Egypt and do the uh, Passover. So in Exodus 12, 29, um, it says, And it came to pass at midnight, the Lord smote the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So the death angel came over the land at midnight from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So, this is going to picture, the death angel is going to picture the, hi James, good evening, um, the death angel pictures the arrival of Antichrist, very simply put. When Antichrist arrives, he's going to pretend to be Jesus. So he's not going to be in wearing red pajamas. He's not going to be using a pitchfork. He's not going to be poking people and hunting people down. He's going to pretend to be Jesus. But the death that is coming from this death angel is one of spiritual death. So he's going to pretend to be Jesus, like literally the Jesus. And so people will think he is Jesus. And that will cause spiritual death. Um, but it's not a physical death. So you won't be able to see people dying. That's why the scriptures talk about the dead bodies will be everywhere and they won't be buried. Why won't the dead bodies be buried? Because they don't know they're dead. Okay, They don't know what spiritual death is. And so that happens at midnight. Now, if we go to Judges 7.19, um, we're going to look at the story of Gideon. Now, Gideon was going to go, they were oppressed for seven years against, um, I think it's Midian. I can't remember. And um, so Gideon was like the youngest uh, child in the family, and he... Um, you know, was hiding, uh, basically hiding and threshing the wheat so that nobody could see him. And God found him and said, um, I think he was of Manasseh, and said, uh, I, I'm choosing you. Now he had, like, um, to go up against this this uh, army that was oppressing him, there, he had an army of 32,000 people. But there was a lot of people in the group that were just petrified. They were so scared of the coming battle. So he just got up in front of all the people and said, Hey, if you're afraid, just go home. I just don't want you in my army. Just go home. Bye-bye. Go home. So that cut his army down to a couple thousand. And then um, God said, Take them down to the water. And when they get down to the water, those who just lay down on the ground and lap up the water like a dog... I want you to send them home. But those that squat down at the water and scoop the water up and look and watch and continue to watch, 
they're going to be your army. So it turned out Gideon had a total of 300 men. And so when he went up the hill to surround the camp on the hilltops, or at least I get the idea he went up on the hill, and he said he had 300 men. And he said, a uh, 100 are going to go over here, and a 100 over here, and a 100 with me. And so that takes you to Judges 7.19. So Gideon and the 100 men that were with him came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch. And so that means it just began. So it was midnight. Same time that the death angel passed over the camp. And they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands and blew with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, the name Gideon, I was going to remember what it meant means hewer. Um, so the sword of the Lord is exactly what we are going to base our prophetic interpretation on. And that is what's going to keep the death angel from entering your house. And this is a, on a very personal level. This is um, each and every one of you um, are going to research this for yourself and meet with God yourself because you are going to have to answer God yourself um, if you use the sword of the Lord, if you have the seal of God. That um, blood that was put over the door, the blood of Christ, that is symbolic of the uh, covering of Jesus Christ's blood over over you so when the death angel comes he will why would that matter because we know who the true Christ is that died for our sins and we know that when the Antichrist comes he's he comes at the sixth trump and that is before the true Christ comes at the seventh so we know the first False Christ that shows up, that's supernatural, that rides in on the clouds. So I think it's written in Jeremiah 4, verse 15, I think, that he comes in on the clouds. In fact, I'm just going to turn there real quick. Because we got the watch. We're setting up the watch as it is written in the scriptures. Because the scriptures say, you want to be part of that army. If you want to set up the standard, which I'm going to get to in um, late in Jeremiah, um, you have to have, you have to know what the enemy's MO is, method of operation. So in Jeremiah 4 verse 13, now this was ultimately prophesying of the king of Babylon coming to the kingdom of Judah to take it over. That's what it was prophesying of. But I want you to look carefully at this prophecy because it's really talking about the arrival of the Antichrist. Okay? Even a full wind from, and this is, uh, oh, what, Jeremiah 4, verse 13, not 12. Behold, he shall come up as clouds. So the the king of Babylon came up as clouds with his armies, but the Antichrist, when he comes, is literally going to come up on clouds. Not from under rocks, not from behind buildings. He's going to come from the sky, a supernatural arrival. He shall be as a whirlwind. Whirlwinds are very, very tumultuous. Lots of smoke, lots of uh, debris, lots of confusion. His horses are swifter than eagles. Hmm, where do eagles fly? They fly in the sky. Woe unto me, for we are spoiled. 
Now, we who have set the watch, we who are watchmen are not going to be spoiled. We're going to have the blood of Jesus Christ on that doorpost over our heart and mind. And if you know what happens at the sixth trump, and you know what happens at the seventh trump, then you know that the first one that arrives is the is is not the real Messiah. I don't care how supernatural he is. I don't care what his abilities are. I don't care how many angels he can that come with him. It's really important that we set the watch because his arrival comes at the middle, just like the death angel came. The beginning of the middle. So many people preach that that there's um there's a seven year period and the antichrist comes at the beginning of the seven years and then pops up from under a rock in the middle but that that is not correct he was never given seven years he comes at the middle at the that's his beginning his beginning is the middle watch so it's really important that you set that in your mind so we also see that watch being set in Jeremiah 51, 51 verse 12, okay, set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon, make the watch strong, okay, so this is God speaking to you, okay, so we aren't necessarily looking for the return of the Lord. We're looking for the return of a thief. So there's an additional scripture I want to mention here in the New Testament before I get into this Jeremiah 51. Let's see if I can back up to it because I know I had it pulled up here. There it is, Matthew 24. Okay, so Matthew 24 verse 42 this is really interesting because many people say well we don't know what day or hour the lord is coming so therefore well, we just can't count anything and and we we can't look at any season and we can't look at the watch we just we just don't know we completely don't know therefore we're not going to look at anything okay so matthew 24 says watch therefore for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay. So we don't know what hour the Lord comes. All right. What does verse 43 say? But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, okay, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So, in essence, he's telling us to watch, to know what watch the thief is coming. And don't set the date that the Lord's returning, because that's the seventh, that's after. We're looking at the watch in which the thief is coming. And the thief is coming. So if we look back at Jeremiah 51, it says, Set up the standard upon the walls of Babylon. Make the watch strong. Now you know why you want to make your watch strong. Because that's when the thief is coming. He's coming in the beginning of the middle watch. And you might say, well, well when is that? Um, that's the... That's what we're looking at in Daniel's days. I do believe that Daniel's days give us the watch to watch for. So we are told to make the watch strong, set up the watchmen, prepare the ambushes. For the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, who is that? That's Revelation 17, the mystery horror of Babylon. She is a city. It's defined for you in Revelation 17. 
She's the city of Jerusalem. That's where all the sin is going to be centered on. And she sits on the waters, which means she sits on all the people and nations of the world. The, the nations of the world have been set up and put in place so that the king of Babylon or Satan can come and rule them. So they are separate nations all the way up until the king of Babylon comes at the beginning of the middle watch. Because when he arrives, he, he subdues three kings, Daniel 7, 24. He subdues three kings and brings all the nations of the world together into one world system. So many people have their watch set to the seven-year peace treaty. But in Daniel 9, 27, there, there is no seven-year peace treaty. This may shock you. If, you. if you've ever studied prophecy, you, you, you might say, but that's what all the prophets preach, a seven-year peace treaty. And we got peace treaties go popping off left and right here. Um, and we will have peace, 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 and then shall come sudden destruction. But there's not going to be a seven-year peace treaty because in Daniel 9.27 in the Septuagint, the, well, even in the King James, the word is bereath, and the subject is the salvation covenant. Daniel prays for it, and God is the keeper of the covenant in Daniel 9 verse 4. He's the keeper of the salvation covenant. And Daniel prays for like 15 verses about people all the way since the Exodus and all of their sins that they've done. And he's praying for the people. Please, Lord, save this people. And the answer is in verse 27, that that salvation covenant will come and it will grow in breadth and length. This is a Septuagint that you don't have. It will grow in breadth and length. That's not a peace treaty. It's not a peace treaty. This tribulation does not start with a peace treaty. This tribulation starts with his arrival. Remember Jeremiah 4 verse 13. He comes on clouds. Okay. And he does set up a one world system. And, and a one world peace system. But it doesn't start before he gets here. There's no one world peace treaty before the Antichrist gets here or the supernatural being. So the watch that you need to set up is we need to know the chain of events as they're coming. Because if you have the wrong chain of events and you are looking for a seven year peace treaty or a five month peace treaty, you're looking for something that's not going to happen. There's not going to be a seven year peace treaty. In fact, just the opposite, the wars, rumors of wars are going to escalate as they get closer. And that's when that deadly wound happens. That's going to be the escalation of war to the point where I'm thinking almost World War III. When a certain group of people tries to take the Temple Mount, that is the one head mentioned in Revelation. Remember, just one head receives the deadly wound. That's a nation. And in Trump 2, uh, Revelation, um, the second Trump, there's one mountain that is caught on fire and cast into the sea. This is not a meteor. This is a nation on fire, a, a nation in trouble. And they cry out to their own Messiah the same nation that's going to receive the deadly wound. And again, in Daniel chapter 8, you've got the he-goat nation, which is the same as the false fig tree nation. And they have a horn. It's called in the Hebrew, well, in the English, it's called the notable horn. And the word notable is the word vision. They have a religious vision that's pointed directly at the Temple Mount. And that he-goat, the horn upon that he-goat is notable. That's their vision. And when their vision is broken, and the horn is always symbolized as the king of one nation. 
The translation given by the angel of the vision is that the horn equals a king. In chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, the horns, the ten horns equal ten kings. So in Daniel chapter 8, you have a horn. It equals one king of a nation. So it's the same nation. So as watchmen, we're not looking for a peace treaty, a one world peace treaty. If you're looking for a one world peace treaty, by the time it happens, Satan, the Antichrist, will already be here because he's the one that does it. He's the one that in Jeremiah 25 that brings together like 15 different nations and he rules over all of them. He's the picture of the Antichrist. He is our picture that when he arrives, he sets up that golden statue. That's what the king of Babylon did. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Golden statue. One world one world order because the statue had the head of gold and the chest of gold and it was all gold 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 every single kingdom because he wanted to rule the entire world that was his kingdom so in jeremiah 51 it says set up the standard upon the walls of babylon make the watch strong so we're commanded to know when the thief comes we're commanded to know what watch he comes? The beginning of the middle. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes. For the Lord hath devised and done that which spake against the inhabitants of Babylon. And I guess I already read that. The Lord has sworn by himself, saying, Surely I will fill thee with men as with caterpillars. So that's locusts. And he's saying Babylon's going to be full of locusts. When are they full of these locusts? Because there's four stages. So the very last stage, they will lift up a shout against thee. These uh, locusts come in with the arrival. They come in with the arrival of Satan. Um, if, if we look back at Jeremiah 4 again, Oh, there's lots of um, references to this locust army that comes in. Jeremiah 4, there's so many uh, keys to this arrival. This arrival coming in the middle, the beginning of the middle watch. So you could say it happens at the be beginning of the middle of five months. Um, it originally was going to happen in the beginning of the middle of seven years. A time, time and a half was originally three and a half years. But Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22, that the, the time of Satan, specifically his time, has been shortened, shrunk. And we're given the key to that time, again in Revelation 9, that five-month period. And we're told that there will be silence in heaven for half of that five-month period. So those kings are with him, and they do not come to earth. They go, they ascend like smoke up to the heavens. And they don't, they don't come down until they're thrown down to the river Euphrates. So, and again, Jeremiah kind of is the key to all of this. But you have exactly how he's going to arrive. He shall come up as clouds. So when you're setting the watch... You are to warn the people that he's coming on the clouds, just like Jesus is supposed to come, but before, at the sixth trump, deceitfully. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. So also in Jeremiah 4, we're given the, the, the command, declare ye in Judah, and publish in Jerusalem, and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry together, and say, Assemble yourselves, and let us go into the defensed cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. So again, Jeremiah keeps saying, Set up the standard. What is the standard? The standard is God's plan. 
set that up before their eyes. Here's the plan. First you have the sixth trump, the arrival, and then you have the seventh trump. Let the people know that it happens in this order so they can know that the first one is a fake. Blow you the trumpet in the land, cry together, and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay night. Don't relax. Don't kick back, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction, because that's where he comes from. The north is typifying the other dimension, a far country. He's coming from another dimension. He's getting kicked out of heaven by Michael and by God. As it is written in Revelation 12, it's also written in Daniel chapter 10. Between the fight between the prince of Persia and then comes the prince of Grisha. So I'm going to look at that. Um, we could probably come back to Jeremiah 4 if anybody wants to go back to that. But in Daniel 10, we're kind of given another side view of the heavenly events of the very, very end. before, Right before Satan arrives. So Daniel is kind of picturing you. Daniel pictures you, the priests of God that are on the earth, that know what the watch is. They know when it is. And Daniel kind of goes, his, his time of mourning is set to a specific day in the Hebrew solar calendar, which happens to be March 22nd. So if March 20th is the first day, because it's, it's the spring equinox in most years, um, rarely it's the 21st. I think this year it was the 21st, but um, most years it's the 20th. So when you go from the 20th, the 21st, the 22nd, that's the third day of the first month. Okay? That day is March 22nd every single year. And he went into mourning on March 22nd in some year. Well, actually, it tells you what year. The third year of Cyrus. So, and then the angel Gabriel says um, to him in verse uh, Daniel 10, verse 11, He said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for I am now... For unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken the word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. The very first day, so that, that March 22nd. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. Okay, so king of Persia here is picturing Satan in heaven. So in Revelation 9, we have a five-month period. God gives them a decree. He says, you can have five months you can have it go to earth give it your best but what do they do they go to heaven they have horses prepared in the battle in in revelation 9 7 and their their chariots are running to the battle in revelation 9 9 and this is picturing that great war in heaven that's coming mentioned in revelation 12 that Michael and his angels fought against Satan and, against, and his angels. So this is giving us a side view of that um, upcoming event. Even though this was uh, happened in the past, uh, it seems like it's picturing that war in heaven between Michael and the prince of Persia. And so what's interesting about this is if you skip down to... Uh, verse 20 in Daniel 10 20 then said he knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia so he's going back to heaven to fight against him 
And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. Now that was Alexander the Great in history. And Alexander's kingdom was divided into four by the four winds. So there you have the Prince of Grisha is picturing that second stage of Satan's arrival, the beginning of the middle watch, because that's when the four winds blow on the earth. So the Prince of Grisha, he goes from the Prince of Persia, heaven, and then he's thrown down to the earth with his, his four horsemen. So in Revelation 9.13, there are four horsemen that come out of the river Euphrates. Same thing with Alexander the Great. His kingdom was divided into four, historically. So what that means for us in prophecy is that Satan's kingdom, he kind of has to share it with his three lieutenants, and he's the fourth. He's the, the rider of the white horse. He looks like Christ. He has a crown. He rides on the clouds. He's the white horse. And the other three are his lieutenants that come out of hell, basically. And they cross over the Euphrates River into our dimension. And Jeremiah 46 confirms that they cross over into our dimension because that's the Euphrates River. It says they're beaten down and they... And they uh, they fall by the river Euphrates, where the Lord has a great sacrifice. Why does he have a great sacrifice? Because he's got to take down that whole army. And um, it talks about him taking down that army in Habakkuk, which is another side view. Is it Habakkuk or Haggai? I think it's Habakkuk. Yeah, it's Habakkuk. A very short book. And Habakkuk is short and sweet. You have the sixth trump in Habakkuk. Again, if you want another side view, you had um, the sixth trump in Revelation. You have the sixth trump in Jeremiah 4.13. It tells you exactly how they arrive. And then in Habakkuk, you also have the sixth trump yet again. Um, in Habakkuk chapter 1. Verse 6, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. Uh, this is a characteristic of the, the nation, the, the peep, the um, locust. They're not slow. They don't take their time. And... Um, and hide behind rocks and pull strings of people. They, no, they're they're bitter. They're so bitter that they they rush God first, and then they come down to the earth hastily. It's they're speeding to the spoil and and hasting to the prey. That's the name that the prophetess in Isaiah chapter eight gave her son. She gave her son a name that means speed to the spoil. And hurry to the prey. Because that's what these guys are going to do. They're not going to sneak around and take their time and tiptoe and play pull strings. No, 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 no. This bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They immediately go to uh, the fourth stage of the locust, which is take over everything. Mow it down. It's, it's a mowing down. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are who are swifter than leopards, and, and they come in on the clouds. Remember Jeremiah 4, so they're, they're swifter than eagles? And they're more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far, they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. So they're, they're in a hurry. They know they have a short time. They know they wasted their first half. That's why we're setting the watch to the beginning of the middle. 
That's when the death angel comes. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings. This is key. Okay? So they're not coming to pull strings of human flesh men. That would be a joke. They wouldn't even... They wouldn't even um, give the flesh men a second thought. <laughs> They're going to mow them down like a freight train. And um, scoff at them. And those three kings that won't subdue, that won't fit in the one world system, which I think are Jacob, Esau, and Ishmael, because they're three factions of brothers that have hated each other. I mean, Jacob and Esau fought in the womb. And then when Jacob grew up, he fought with God all night. He's not him and his seed line and the nations that have sprouted from Jacob, which is America and uh, England and, you know, other European countries. They're not going to just roll over. That's a seed line that wins with God. That's what Israel means. The name Israel that he fought all night. He fought God all night for that name. And he says, I'm not going to stop until you bless me. That's the spirit of Jacob. Jacob is never going to unite with Esau without supernatural assistance. And this army will get it done. They're going to come on clouds and mow them down. This is the thief. The thief is coming. We set the watch so that we suffer not the thief to break up the house. So they gather the captivity as the sand. So they're already taking captives, spiritual captives, spiritually, spiritually deceived. They're just raking it in. False, false, false deception everywhere. They shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. You're going to laugh at them. Kings of the earth, what a joke. Weak humans, you don't stand a chance against them. Um, they shall deride every stronghold and they shall heap dust and take it. They're going to they're gonna take the whole world. That's the one world system. They're going to take it all together. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. That's the Antichrist. Art thou, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die. We shall not die. The wicked are going to spiritually die. They're not going to know. Because they're going to fall. Falling hard. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. That's why they're going to fall. They're ordained for judgment. And, O oh mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. See, there's a lot of correction that needs to come. A lot of people have discussed what's going to happen to America and all its sins. The correction is this. This is how he's going to correct not only America, but all the other nations, and all the other countries, and all the other people. And he's going to meet you one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, in your heart and in your mind. He's meeting you where you are. And if you are not in this word, grounded and founded, then you will be mowed over in the spiritual deception for a time. And then some people will come out of deception. And that's the whole purpose here. Because God has a salvation plan for this tribulation time. There's a salvation plan. Not a rapture. What? Why not a rapture? Because he wants to save the people on the earth. He wants to give them a chance to hear that word being spoken out of the mouths of the watchman 
And when they hear it, they will come out of deception. And that's the beauty of it, is that man, woman, and child can be in this army. It's not a he-man army. It's not I'm the mightiest and the strongest. It's actually I'm the smallest and the weakest. Therefore, God wants to use me. So, um, so we have here, uh, uh, Habakkuk is talking to God. He says, Thou art of pure eyes, then to behold evil, and canst thou not look on iniquity? Wherefore lookest thou up upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And makest men the fishes of the sea as the creepy, creeping things that have no rules, no ruler over them. So there, um, this is, this is an allusion to the spiritual death again in the sea. The third of the sea turns into blood. One of the trumps, one of the vials is the whole sea and all the rivers turn into blood. And uh, they take up all of them with the angle, and they catch them in their net, and gather them in their drag. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net, and burn incense unto their drag. Because by them their portion is fat, and their meat plenteous. So, shall they therefore empty their net, and not spare continually to slay the nations? Uh, no. They're not going to stop. They're, they're not going to stop their deception. Because they're bitter and hasty. If you flip back, they're a bitter and hasty nation. That is the sixth Trump vision. And what, the reason I went to Habakkuk, I think it's in Habakkuk. Now I'm starting to think it might be Haggai after all. So in Habakkuk 2, it says, I will stand upon my watch and set upon the tower. Okay, because you don't want to suffer the thief to break up your house. Set the watch. When does it start? It starts at the sixth trump. It starts with a bitter and hasty nation coming on the clouds, mowing everything up. And will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Okay? What was the vision that we were just reading? The bitter and hasty nation arriving, mowing everything down, like scoffing at the kings. That's the vision you need to be writing. Write that vision. Publish that vision in Jerusalem. Set that standard up. Set the watch. And shout, when it's time, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Make it plain. So my pastor may always made it very plain the sixth trump comes before the seventh. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and shall not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. So we may be in that point of time where it seems like it's tarrying, but wait for it. Because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Now, what I believe this tarry but not tarry means is that originally Satan was given three and a half years. But when Jesus shortened the time, he shortened the time to five months. And then half of that time they waste running to heaven, battling God, the war in heaven. So now... The beginning of the middle watch is two and a half months. And all of that time that originally we were going to have, the three and a half years, we still have the time itself. But 
the Antichrist, his time has kind of been taken away from him. So it was taken away from him and kind of given to the people of the world as a reprieve. It's a short time that we have to witness, to set the watch, so that all the people know, set the standard. What is the standard? We have to know the sixth trump and the seventh trump. That's the standard. And then that army is that sacrifice. And it goes on to say, if you continue in Habakkuk chapter 2, who sets up the one world system? Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man. We know who this is. Satan, the Antichrist, neither keepeth at home who enlargeth his desire as hell and is as death. Hebrews 2, I think, verse 14. We know who death is. It's Satan, the Antichrist. And cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations. There's that fourth beast the nations of the earth when combined with the supernatural rulers who scoff at them is the fourth beast and heapeth unto him all people he's, he's getting all the people of the world and heaping them up that's that's who sets up the one world system it's satan the antichrist so in a way that's the league the, you could call it a peace treaty, it would be false peace, uh, the League of Nations. That's when everything is set up into one world system. It does not happen until this guy does it. He's the one that keeps up the nations. Habakkuk 2 verse 5 says, But gathereth unto him all nations, Mr. Death, and heapeth unto him all people. Yeah. We don't need to be afraid, though. Because the next verse says, Shall not all these take up a parable against him, a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increases that which is not his? How long, cries the prophet. We know how long, because God has told us. And to him... That ladeth himself with thick clay. I think that says ladeth. And then uh, we see that that army is taken out. I thought it was Habakkuk. Oh, there's the fig tree. Maybe I should read all of Habakkuk. Interesting, interesting. I'm just going to read this fig tree part because it just popped out at me. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the field, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. That is your hope. That's the salvation Daniel prayed for in chapter 9. Daniel prayed for salvation. He didn't pray for utter murder to happen for seven long years and torture. While we're raptured in heaven, what a great joy that will be while everybody on earth is tortured, murdered, hunted down, left for dead on the side of the road and abandoned by God. That's not a hope. There's no hope in that. The hope is in the salvation that Habakkuk talks here. Even though you see the fig tree languishing and, and no fruit on the vine and wickedness all around, even though you see that spiritual deprivation is basically what they're calling it. Yet I, my hope, my joy is that God is a plan of salvation right here on earth. And it's not to rapture me. 
It's to speak through me. That's the joy, is that we can, we, God's mighty army, is made up of weak, small, and young. Because that's, that's what he wanted with Gideon's army. He didn't want numbers. He didn't want the biggest number of people. He had 300 men. And those 300 men had such a chore. They, they had to carry up a mountain a trumpet, a lamp with a pot over it, and tromp up the mountain just 300 measly men. And then while they're blowing the trumpets, they got to break the lamp so that the light shines all at the same time and then shout with their mouth. So both hands are busy, your feet are busy, and your mouth is speaking the truth, the sword of the Lord. So this is the joy. It's not the rapture. The rapture is not joyous. The rapture is treacherous and horrible. Mass death, murder, mayhem on the earth. That is not joyful. Just because we're not here does not mean that that is hope for the people. That is no hope. That's the opposite of hope. What we want is salvation for the people. So even though we have spiritual deprivation, it's not going to be a physical murder. It's going to be spiritual. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. We're not he men or he women. We're not strong because we're physically able to withstand it. Or we swim the fastest or fight the hardest. We, we're strong because God is our strength. And he will make my feet like Heinz feet. That's like a doe. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instrument. So I really wanted to read about that army and it's probably in Haggai. So Haggai, Haggai, yeah, it's Haggai. I got my minor prophets mixed up. So we were talking about that army and how God has a sacrifice by the river Euphrates. Um, and at the end of Haggai chapter 2, which is that my favorite verse, chapter 2, verse 18, Consider now from this day upward, from the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month, another dated solar calendar date, which can be identified as December 11th, pretty easily. You count each month from the 19th, and get around November 19th and count to the um, 24th day, it takes you to December 11th. of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. So we're told to can literally count up from that day. Is the seed yet in the barn? So look around at the spiritual depravity watchman. Set the watch. Set up the standard. What is the standard? Is this the standard? Is God's word the standard? The sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. That's what you cry. That's where your visions come from. Uh, the young men and your young daughters shall prophesy first and then have dreams and visions. Their dreams and visions are based on the prophecy of God's word, it is written. It is written right here. And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month saying, so all of this happens on the same day. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. This is your fourth beast getting thrown down. It's not necessarily killing all the people. It's, it's destroying the kingdoms and, and putting everybody in a spiritual body. 
and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. Remember the king of Babylon and Habakkuk, he gathers them up and heaps them up unto himself that are not his. They're not his to heap up. And I will overthrow the chariots. There's your sacrifice by the river Euphrates. And those that ride in them and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. That's that army that's going to, that, that Jeremiah speaks of. So I think, I think I'm going to reach the end here. Um, Jeremiah 46. Jeremiah 46. Jeremiah 46. Let's just read about this great river Euphrates. This word Euphrates is only used like five times in the whole Bible. And I'm going to double check that. Maybe you should double check that. Double check me. Um, let's, it might be six times. Okay. So Jeremiah 46. Egypt rises up like a flood and his waters are moved like the rivers and he saith I will go up and I will cover the earth that's the that's the arrival that's the sixth trump remember they mow it down uh, they take what's not theirs they're hasty bitter and hasty nation in verse 9 come up you horses and rage you chariots and those are the ones the horses and the chariots that at the seventh trump are going to be taken down and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopian, the Libyan, the handle of the shield, the Lydians, the handle of the bend the bow, for this is the day of the Lord God, of hosts, a day of vengeance. See, this is his vengeance. This is the punishment, the spiritual deception. Their arrival is the vengeance. And we don't have to fear, because we know their salvation. Same salvation Daniel prayed for is what we pray for. We don't pray for escape. We pray for salvation. For Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice. So I, I read the whole verse. For the day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour. And it shall be satiate and make drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. So that army and all of it is going, the fourth beast of Daniel, that's the sacrifice. That beast is going to be sacrificed. It, it's going to be cut down. No more kings of the earth. Because it says in Revelation 11, which is the seventh trump, let's just cover that. One of my favorite verses. Revelation 11 is the seventh trump. And verse, I should, I should specify. Revelation 11, verse 12. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. Those are the three, the two witnesses that died. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand. That's the sacrifice by the river Euphrates. It's part of it anyway. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that is the seventh trump. And I'm going to end it there. I hope you enjoyed the study. I don't see any questions off to the side here, but you can always ask questions later. Put them in the comments and um, uh, make sure that, you know, if you're seeing this video that you come to my original video so that I can answer the questions because I can't always see them on other people's pages. 
Um, and if it's on YouTube, just, you know, my comments are open. Uh, let's set the watch and let's um, follow these verses and um, in the Lord's name and, and, and do his will so that we suffer not our house to be broken up by the thief. Everybody have a great night. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.